Lord, you know I cannot preach. All right. If you will open the way, I mean, if you will send an invitation for me to preach, then, Lord, I'll go. <laughs> it isn't very likely that anyone will ask a 49-year-old farmer to preach on the coming of the Lord. It was a Saturday morning in August 1831, and an unremarkable start to the most important day in the life of the New England farmer, William Miller. But in the space of half an hour, something happened that was to change his whole life. My nephew, what is it? Uncle William, our minister is unable to speak at service tomorrow. Father sent me to ask you if you could come and speak to us about the things that you've been reading about in the Bible. About the prophecies and the second coming of Christ. Will you come? Like many others who have joined God's army down through the centuries, William Miller was a somewhat reluctant recruit. Yet this unpretentious farmer from New York was to have a profound influence upon the lives of thousands of men and women the world over. For there went into that maple grove a farmer, but there came out a preacher. Miller's story, however, does not really begin in the maple grove. Events even in the ancient city of Rome played a part. The Sistine Chapel near St. Peter's Basilica in Rome is famous for its history as well as for its art. Erected by Pope Sixtus IV in 1473, it is the place where the church cardinals meet to elect a new pope. On its walls and ceilings can be seen these magnificent paintings of scenes and characters from the Old and New Testaments. But the Sistine Chapel is also significant in another way, for here prophecy and history have met. Michelangelo could never have realized when he painted the figure of Daniel on the ceiling early in the 16th century that one of Daniel's prophecies would be fulfilled here less than 300 years later. Daniel's prophecy in his seventh chapter had revealed that the rise of the little horn power from the fourth great empire of Rome would be opposed by three kingdoms. 
when these three kingdoms were subdued, Daniel said that God's people would then be given into the little horn's hand for a period of 1,260 years. But how was this to be fulfilled? In 533 AD, Emperor Justinian I, the supreme civil ruler of the time, proclaimed that the Bishop of Rome was to be the head of all the churches in both the east and west of his territory. By subjecting all spiritual authority to the Pope, Justinian virtually gave God's people into his hand and placed the civil sword at the pontiff's ultimate disposal. But the decree could not go into effect so long as the third and final kingdom opposing the Roman bishop, the Arian Ostrogoths, ruled Italy. Their power was broken when Justinian's army broke their siege of Rome in 538 AD. It was in this year then that the ancient seat of the Roman Empire was finally preserved for the papacy and the period of its ecclesiastical supremacy began. One thousand two hundred and sixty years later, Napoleon's confidant and associate, General Berthier, was ordered to march on Rome and bring the supremacy of its church to an end. On February the 15th, 1798, the new Republican government was established and the papal arms and insignia removed from the city. The events of history fulfilled exactly the words of the prophecy. A little over 100 years earlier, an Oxford University Doctor of Divinity had been the first to declare that the 1260-year prophecy would end, as he said, a little before the year 1800. Soon others took the same position. Some, like the famous clergyman, philosopher and scientist Joseph Priestley, even declared that France would most likely be the instrument to accomplish it. When the stroke finally fell upon Rome in 1798, a chorus of voices in England, Europe and America witnessed to the end of the 1,260 years of papal supremacy. In spite of creedal differences on other points of faith, there was a remarkable unity in their basic prophetic interpretations received from the earlier great reformers. They taught the four world empires of prophecy, the divisions of Rome, the rise of the Antichrist, the day for a year principle, and the approaching judgment and second coming of Christ. With their interest aroused in such a remarkable fulfillment of prophecy, these Bible scholars began to look more closely at the longest of Daniel's time prophecies described in chapter 8. The prediction is made in verse 14, in answer to a question asked about the time period covered by the vision. When was God going to do something about the desolating power that was treading down his sanctuary and his people? The answer is given, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The study of this time period had intrigued Bible students for hundreds of years. Jewish scholars from as early as the 8th century and Christian scholars from late in the 13th century had identified the 2,300 days as representing 2,300 years. Though many continue to study this time prophecy, its meaning, however, remained a mystery. Which is not surprising, really, for in Daniel 8, the angel Gabriel told Daniel that the 2,300 day year period would not be fulfilled until the time of the end. And in Daniel 12, the prophet was commanded to seal up his book until that same time. The meaning of the 2,300 year prophecy was evidently not to be clearly understood until the time of its fulfillment drew near. It was Sir Isaac Newton, one of the most brilliant men who ever lived, who formulated the laws of gravitation and certain of the laws of motion. He also discovered the secrets of light and colour. 
What many do not know is that Newton wrote more words on theology than he did on science, for he was a great student of Bible prophecy. In his book on Daniel and Revelation, he described a significant principle relating to prophecy and its fulfillment. It is a principle so important that Jesus expressed it twice to his disciples on the night before he died, recorded in John 13 and 14. In the 14th chapter, Jesus said, I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. Sir Isaac Newton believed that God has designed that people shall understand the prophecies only when the time of their fulfillment is at hand. And this prophetic principle is supported by the facts of history. When Rome was ruling the Western world, a large group of contemporary students of prophecy recognized the identity and fate of the fourth prophetic empire. When Rome was being divided, another group of expositors wrote of their fears of the coming Antichrist. When the papal little horn had unveiled its real character and identity, a great army of reformers in many lands gave their witness to the fulfillment of prophecy. The Ghost explains the same more clearly in other places, so that there can remain no doubt, but under such as are obstinately ignorant. When the 1,260 years were ending, this too was proclaimed in both the old and new worlds. But in the 19th century, the focus of interest in different continents and many lands and among all denominational groups was the 2,300 years of Daniel 8. And one such witness was the Baptist preacher who became the leader in the United States of the great movement that emphasized the soon coming of Jesus early in the 19th century, William Miller. But just what sort of a man was William Miller? Miller was born in Massachusetts in the year 1782. When he was four years old, his family moved to Lowhampton, New York. The eldest of 16 children, he was taught by his God-fearing mother to reverence the Bible as God's revelation to man. At the age of 21, Miller married Lucy Smith and he and his new wife moved nearby to her hometown of Poultney in Vermont. Removed from the religious influence of his mother, Miller was attracted to the philosophy of deism promoted by his friends. To the deist, God is a kind of absentee landlord who has no interest in his creation. Consequently, prayer, the Bible, or the notion of a savior have no meaning. In his book, Apology and Defense, Miller later wrote about this experience. I concluded the Bible was only the work of designing men and I discarded it accordingly. But Miller possessed personal qualities that encouraged others to have confidence in him. He became a deputy sheriff and a lieutenant in the Vermont State Militia. During the American War of 1812, he worked his way to the rank of captain in the United States Army. It was in the summer of 1814 that he fought in the famous Battle of Plattsburgh, one of the deciding conflicts of the war. The American forces were apprehensive against the well-drilled British redcoats who outnumbered them three to one. But their surprising victory served to raise questions in Miller's mind, for the outcome seemed to him like the work of a mightier power than man. In 1815, Miller returned to Lowhampton and built on 200 acres this comfortable two-storey house by an old maple grove. Though he now believed in a supreme being, he did not yet believe God had given any written revelation. However, convicted one day of his sinfulness, he began to wonder how a just being could save the violators of his laws. Suddenly, the character of a saviour was vividly impressed upon his mind. He felt he could trust in the mercy of such a one. But did this saviour exist?
Late in 1816, in the Baptist church here in Hampton, he found Jesus as a saviour and friend, and the Bible became a delight. But his dearest friends were quick to challenge his new faith in the scriptures as a revelation from God. Laying aside every book except the Bible and Cruden's Concordance, Miller began with Genesis 1 and proceeded no faster than his understanding of the meaning of each text would allow. He spent two years in an intensive study of the Bible, a task so absorbing that he often spent whole days and nights in his study. And what were some of the conclusions he'd reached by 1818? I'm fully satisfied that the Bible is its own interpreter and that it is simple enough to be understood by all. I am also convinced that it should be read literally unless there is clear proof that the writer is using figurative language. And the Old Testament prophecies? I acknowledge their figurative form, but they nearly always have a literal fulfillment. Take, for instance, the birth, the death, the resurrection of Christ. These were literal events, but their prophecies were framed in symbolic language, and it is the same today. The signs of the times and the present condition of the world match up with the prophetic description of the last days. I am convinced that the world has reached the limits of its allotted time. Jesus Christ is about to return in all his glory. Miller's conclusion was an interesting one, for it ran contrary to the predominant idea of the second coming held by most of the Protestant churches of his day. They had taught that the millennium, or period of a thousand years described in Revelation 20, would be ushered in by a world conversion. This would lead to a millennial reign of peace and righteousness on the earth. The second coming of Christ would then occur at the end of the thousand years. While some thought that they recognised the signs that the millennium was about to commence in the early 1800s, Miller, on the other hand, was convinced that Christ's coming was imminent and would occur at the beginning of the thousand years. I am certain that we have been wrong about all this. Just listen to Daniel 8 and verse 14. Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The following chapter indicates that the 2,300 years begin with the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem in 457 B.C., which means they end in 1843. The Bible seems to teach that the sanctuary means the earth. Its cleansing must be the cleansing by fire at the second coming of Christ. which means in about 25 years the world will end and Jesus will come. In fact, Miller spent the next 13 years examining and re-examining the arguments for and against his beliefs. And all the time the conviction grew that he had a personal duty to tell the world of his conclusions. When his years of research had finally removed all doubt, fear of public speaking took its place. Until that troubled Saturday in the Maple Grove in August, 1831. Miller accompanied his nephew Irving Guilford to the Guilford home in Dresden. In deference to Miller's lack of confidence, his relatives invited the neighbours to their home rather than to the Little Baptist Church that Sunday. And the text of his sermon, Daniel chapter 7, explained just as the great reformers had explained it before him, but with the added fulfilment of the 1260 years in 1798. It was John Knox's preaching from Daniel 7 in 1547 that launched the Reformation in Scotland. But now William Miller goes one step further. He adds an explanation of chapters 8 and 9 of Daniel to launch the great Advent movement in the New World.
When Miller returned home, invitations for him to speak began to come from places near and far. His second series of meetings was held in this stately Baptist meeting house in Poultney, his old hometown. Miller could never have dreamed that within 15 years, his influence would extend from Lowhampton right across the world. Though Miller had come to his conclusions from his own study of the scriptures, his views were by no means unique to him. Even before he published this book of his lectures in 1836, there were some 75 others scattered across four continents who anticipated his major findings. Despite their different cultural and denominational backgrounds, they were all in essential agreement concerning the 2,300 years being fulfilled during the 1840s. And so the warning of the coming judgment and the soon coming of Jesus was given in the old world as well as in the new. In Great Britain alone, more than 1,000 ministers preached it. In Sweden, where preaching contrary to the established church was illegal, young children proclaimed the soon advent of Christ. In the United States, Miller's message was heard in the leading cities of the nation. The Lord is coming. His arrival is imminent. Are you ready to meet him? Ministers of many denominations, convinced by the truth of Miller's message, joined him in its proclamation. Contemporary estimates of their numbers ran from 700 to 2,000. It's Christ's second coming. And we've also seen... General conferences were organized in the form of great public rallies. Camp meetings were conducted. 125 of them between 1842 and 1844, with the total attendance estimated to be half a million people. The printing press had an even greater effect than did public evangelism. By May 1844, it was claimed that five million copies of Second Advent papers had been circulated. The Millerite preachers were alert to every available means of making their message clear and plain. This chart, with its pictures and figures, clearly focused on the climactic year of 1843, when the Lord was expected to come. Not everyone took these preachers seriously. A legislator introduced a bill to postpone the end of the world till 1860. Another offered reserved seats on an escape balloon for $200. Miller himself had always been reluctant to set an exact date. However, as 1843 approached, he was pressed to be more specific. Because the Jewish sacred year began in the spring, the 2,300th year from the spring of 457 B.C. will be between the spring of 1843 and the spring of 1844. But the spring of 1844 passed, and Christ did not return. Turning to the scriptures for a solution to their problem, the Millerites came across the parable of the ten virgins in Matthew chapter 25. And in verse 5, they read the phrase, while the bridegroom tarried. Evidently, there was to be a tarrying time. And so they waited until August 1844, when a remarkable development occurred. At the Exeter camp meeting in New Hampshire, a Millerite preacher, Samuel Snow, electrified his audience. He pointed out first that according to Ezra 7, the decree to rebuild Jerusalem that commenced the 2,300 years did not begin until the autumn of 457 BC. Therefore, the 2,300 years would have to end in the autumn, not the spring. But on what day in the autumn? From his study of the Jewish spring and autumn feasts in the book of Leviticus, Snow concluded that Jesus would appear on the 10th day of the seventh month. The very best evidence indicates that the 10th day of the seventh Jewish month will occur on October 22 in 1844. 
Therefore, in less than three months, the bridegroom will be here to take his waiting bride. Is it not time for us to hear the cry at midnight, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. The hills of New England soon rang with the midnight cry. Miller himself was among the last to accept the date. But he and the other leaders felt that to remain silent any longer seemed to be in opposition to the work of the Holy Spirit. As the days counted down, many were baptized. Believers closed their stores, gave up their jobs, confessed their faults, and spent hours in prayer. Finally, the overworked printing presses stopped running. The great tent was packed away for the last time, and the leaders returned to their homes to be with their families. October is autumn in New England. Just beyond this maple grove where Miller had wrestled with God is a large outcrop of limestone. It is known today as Ascension Rock. Here Miller's friends assembled on Tuesday, October 22, and looking toward the east, they prayerfully waited for Jesus to come. Across the country, tens of thousands of Adventists, as the followers of Miller were now called, met in churches, tents, and private homes. But Jesus did not come. What had begun as a day of sweet expectation ended in the bitter blackness of disappointment. In the days and weeks that followed, humiliation, confusion and doubt threatened to engulf them. Inevitably, the forward momentum of the Advent movement was abruptly stopped. Some gave up. Had William Miller completely misled them? Miller himself never gave up his faith in the soon coming of Jesus. Four years after the disappointment, he built this little chapel on his farm behind Ascension Rock. And the group of believers who continued to share Miller's hope met here with him and his family. Miller had been right in teaching that Jesus was coming again. The New Testament alone refers to this more than 300 times. And he was right in telling people to get ready for Jesus' coming. 
After all, Jesus, Peter, Paul, John, and thousands of Christians down through the ages have said the same. Miller had been right in focusing more upon Jesus than upon any specific date. And he was right in declaring that the 2,300 days stand for 2,300 years. For in stating this day for a year principle, he aligned himself with many eminent Bible scholars and students of the previous 2,000 years. And in proclaiming that the 2,300 years would extend to the 1840s, Miller was only one of thousands of contemporary Bible students who believed the same. So what went wrong? In many ways, it was the same mistake that the disciples made when they thought that the prophecies foretold Christ's coming as a king. It was not the mistake of an irrational crank or the mad reckonings of a fanatical firebrand, but rather it was the honest misunderstanding of the meaning of the Old Testament phrase, the cleansing of the sanctuary. But why did God allow the man he so obviously called for a purpose to make such a major mistake? We may never know the complete answer to this question. But remember, at that time, most Christians believed in a world conversion, with Jesus coming a thousand years later. Perhaps God in his love was sending a message to the world in such a startling manner to warn of increasing evil and trouble preceding the imminent return of his son before the thousand years. Miller was right about his reckoning of Daniel's 2,300 year prophecy. Something was to happen at the end of the 2,300 years, the cleansing of the sanctuary. Such an event demanded the widest publicity and the greatest possible attention. But what this event was, and to what great work it pointed, was for others to discover. Miller died only five years after the great disappointment of October 22, 1844. Just before he died, Miller penned this unfinished letter. Dear brother, I cannot refrain from writing a word or two, although I cannot see. All is well. The bridegroom is coming, no mistake. The king must come. Lift up your head. Be of good cheer. Be not faithless, but believing. We shall soon see him for whom we have looked and waited. 